All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, it's 12 o'clock right on the nose. So we've got a lot to cover and a short amount of time. So uh, we're gonna get going here. A uh, couple of housekeeping things as we get started. This meeting is being recorded. Um, so if you would please keep your videos off and your audio off during for the duration of the webinar. Um, you can have, feel free to use the chat box for any questions, comments, anything like that um, to communicate, please use the chat box and feel free to do so throughout the presentation. I will do my best to monitor it uh, as we go forward. So today we're talking about sexual dysfunction, relationships, addiction, and recovery. So those are a lot of broad terms and a lot of information to cover. So let's dive in. Here's our objectives, which you should have seen in the email that you received. We're gonna be talking about how trauma and active addiction can interfere with um, psychosocial development and effective expression of human sexuality. We're gonna define the relationship between attachment to others and its effects on forming either healthy or unhealthy connectedness with others. And then we're gonna talk about therapeutic interventions in addiction treatment that we can utilize to enhance the desire and ability to form and maintain healthy, affirming attachments with loved ones and friends. So that's what we're gonna to cover today in our hour together. So let's talk about some definitions to get us started. Uh, trauma is a very broad umbrella term that's really just used to describe an emotional response that's caused by experiencing an incident meaning one incident, or a series of incidents um, that are distressing to the person. And they can be emotional, psychological, physical events that are distressing to somebody. And just because somebody experiences a distressing event does not mean that they will experience trauma. So I think we can, um, we can look at here in Louisiana, we have hurricanes and there's been a couple of really difficult hurricanes to get through and difficult recovery efforts. And not everyone that experienced and went through um, a difficult hurricane experienced trauma, but a lot of people did. So it's really the emotional response that we're looking at um, and how that person specifically experienced tra that traumatic event or series of events and how they've responded to it. So trauma is kind of used this, as this umbrella term, and we will, throughout this presentation, talk about trauma in a very general sense, uh, but trauma can include lots and lots of things, whether it's abusive type situations or relationships, uh, you know, disaster events or uh, death of loved ones, things like that, could be military type trauma, um, all sorts of things can be included in someone's experience of trauma. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big worldwide event. It could be something very specific to an experience they had in their life or a series of experiences. So moving on to addiction, addiction is a social term. It's really not a, a diagnostic term. We don't use that when we diagnose according to the DSM-5. Um, it's more of a social construct. And I like John Bradshaw's definition here. Um, a pathological relationship to any mood altering experience that has life damaging consequences. So there's lots of things that we could be addicted to. We could be addicted to chemicals such as drugs and alcohol, prescription medication, things like that. We could be addicted to more behaviors or processes like gambling, sex, uh, shopping, things like that, uh, video games. So, you know, it's just this relationship that is problematic and also whatever the action is, whether it's a chemical or a process or behavior, that that is a mood, mood altering experience for the person. And it has negative consequences that, that um, cause problems in their life. So we'll talk about addiction in a very um, broad way during this presentation as well. Because really what we're gonna kind of hone in on today is more the human sexuality um, element and sexual dysfunction. So human sexuality, again, a big umbrella term, all of these are umbrella terms, but it's the way people experience and express themselves sexually. 
So this can involve biological functions, um, genitalia, uh, hormones, um, chromosomes, things like that, um, erotic, physical, emotional, social, or spiritual feelings and behaviors around not just the act of sex, but how somebody expresses and uh, defines their sexuality. So it's very individualized and unique from person to person, how they experience human sexuality, how they express it, and what that means for the relationships that they're involved in that are of an intimate nature, nature in particular. And then sexual dysfunction is sort of a subset, in essence, of human sexuality, or subdomain, maybe is a better word. So sexual dysfunction is some type of problem that can happen during any phase of the sexual response cycle. So, and, and primarily what the sexual dysfunction does is it prevents a person from experiencing satisfaction from a sexual activity. So it could be a problem that affects desire, uh, arousal, penetration, the act of sex itself, or ability to achieve orgasm. And just as a reminder, we probably all heard about the sexual response cycle in the past, but you may not remember the components of it. Um, but it includes, traditionally, there's a couple of variations on this that we're not going to get into today. But the sexual response cycle really includes excitement. So when you're getting excited for sexual activity, the plateau of um, kind of the involvement in the sexual activity, orgasm, we all know what that is, I think, and then the resolution or the after effects um, where the, the sexual activity is ending and kind of moving into um, recovery of sorts, or you know, just kind of moving on from the sexual experience. So keep in mind these, these definitions as we move through the presentation today. So just to give us a context for what we're talking about related to sexual dysfunction in particular, an estimated 43% of women, 41% of men experience some kind of challenge during intimacy. And really this is across the lifespan. So um, there can be times or a phase of sorts that somebody experiences a sexual dysfunction or a challenge during intimacy. Um, other times it can be more episodic, like maybe with one particular partner, there was challenges and there's not challenges with another partner. Um, things like that. There, there could be all kinds of scenarios wrapped up into this. Um, so keep, you know, this is a very pervasive kind of issue. We're almost at that 50%. So it's very common that people would experience some challenges during during intimacy. So what does that mean for us as counselors and people working in addiction treatment? It really means that this should be something that we kind of talk about with our clients on a regular basis that probably, you know, at least one in four, really it's a, a little more than a third, somewhere between a third and a half of our clients are going to have some kind of challenge during intimacy. So this should be something that we're kind of talking about with any of our clients, because this statistic is not um, specific to just clients with addiction uh, related concerns, but this is anyone. So this is something that we can normalize as a part of our work with clients, that it's okay to talk about sexual challenges and, um, and things that they might be concerned about in their relationships, particularly those intimate sexual relationships. So we're going to kind of cover sexual dysfunction and then go into uh, more psychosocial development across the lifespan. So we are looking at the binary structure of men and women because that's where the literature comes from. Um, historically, we're starting to get some more um, literature around uh, non-binary and transgender in particular, sexual intimacy and related research and literature. So um, I'm gonna save that for another webinar to talk about later. So we're gonna look at the binary structure at this point of men and women. Um, so in men, you got the left side here. There can be all sorts of symptoms, but these are some of the more common ones. An unexplainable lack of interest in sexual intercourse or sexual activity in general. 
Persistent difficulty in producing or maintaining an erection suitable for sex, uh, inability to reach orgasm, or a significant delay in the ability to climax. Consistent difficulty with regulating moments when ejaculation occurs. So kind of that ejaculating prior to, um, to when they want to. Conversely, in women, again, we can have this noticeable disinterest in sexual activity. There can be some difficulty in getting aroused. Um, there can be pain during intercourse in particular. Um, inadequate lubrication during sex. So being a little too dry and thereby it being painful and difficulty relaxing vaginal muscles to permit penetration. So there can be this kind of clenching or tightening up that occurs in the vagina with those muscles. So all of these things may be symptomatic of something that's going on for a person that is you know, causing some problems or some discomfort with their, their sexual activity or their ability to be intimate with their partner. So these are things that clients might say to you that can kind of trigger you to think, hmm, I wonder if there's some sexual dysfunction going on here. And let's start to look at some patterns um, and maybe some ways that we could intervene with that client. So like I mentioned before in the definition of sexual dysfunction, it can occur during any part of the sexual response cycle. So there can be desire related disorders. So it's uh, just lack of interest or lack of desire which could be hormone related or kind of phase of life related, um, you know, and that kind of ebbs and flows throughout our life, but it's kind of unique to each person. Um, and so there could be a desire, a sexual desire issue going on. There could be arousal issues where it's just difficult, takes a long time, or um, it's just hard to get aroused for whatever reason. Uh, challenges with an orgasm or climax, so inability to climax or orgasm, um, or it takes a very long time, or it comes too early perhaps as well. Any of those things could be challenges. And then pain during intercourse. So there could be lots of reasons for pain, but that can be a, um, a, a challenge for clients that they talk about in sessions with us and in their work with us. Okay, so some causes, and these, this is not an exhaustive list at all. There can be all sorts of other things uh, that may cause sexual dysfunction, but these are kind of the major ones to keep in the back of your head for when clients talk about these things um, that should kind of clue us in to think about what could be going on with this client uh, related to their sexual dysfunction. So first we got health challenges. So people that have major illnesses, chronic health conditions, those those kinds of things can absolutely impact their desire and ability um, to engage in sexual activity and thereby cause sexual dysfunction. Uh, hormonal imbalance. So if you're, someone's going through menopause, has low uh, hormone levels or too high of hormone levels that can impact some sexual dysfunction. Uh, for women, gynecologic conditions like endometriosis, endometriosis, cysts, fibroids, that can all lead to painful sex in particular or inability to get proper lubrication to have uh, penetrative sex in particular. And then we have what we're dealing with with our clients in addiction treatment, alcohol and drug use. It can decrease desire, pleasure, arousal, orgasm, and have cause ejaculation difficulty. Psychological factors, pressure at work, school, anxiety, depression, things like that, if they have a mental health related disorder can cause some sexual dysfunction as well. And then medications that go with all of these things that could be going on, medications have side effects. And sometimes those side effects um, cause some sexual dysfunction, specifically around decreased desire and erectile dysfunction are kind of common complaints. Particularly if your clients are taking medications for psychological related issues like SSRIs or um, medications that are typically used for mood disorders often have a side effect of uh, erectile dysfunction for men in particular, which is problematic. Um, but also this decreased desire is a very common complaint from clients when they're taking um, SSRIs in particular. 
So that can all be real concerns for clients. Oops, went backwards there. So how does this all impact psychosocial development? You know, we develop throughout our lifespan. A lot of times we want to think about um, children and how children develop. We are constantly developing throughout the course of our life. So we're going to take a look at Eric Erickson's stages of social development, which is really just through childhood, and then a human sexuality development model um, and kind of parallel those Erickson stages with this human sexuality development stages um, model that we have here. So let's dive into that. So early childhood, thinking about birth to three years approximately. Um, so the sexual development kind of encompasses all three of those years. Erickson stages are stages one and two. So looking at sexual development, when you think about a baby, an infant up to three years of age, there's lots that they learn um, sexually, mostly related to anatomy and how, do you, how um, their anatomy functions. And then they're starting to learn things about gender roles and, um, and you know, like boys have penises, girls have vaginas, they learn things like that. Uh, but there's kind of an emotional attachment component, which we're gonna go into attachment in a little more detail shortly. But one of the main things that, that uh, kids learn at this age is learning about love and trust through touching and holding. So as caregivers hold the child or the infant that the child is gaining some kind of an attachment with that caregiver. Um, kids tend to put things in their mouth. There's an oral component to learning about the world around them. There may be some spontaneous reflexive responses in genitalia. They might have random erections or random vaginal lubrication, not because of arousal necessarily. It's just a body function. <coughs> They start to understand some concepts around gender ident identity. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to try not to cough throughout this um, and have a dry cough that won't go away. So my apologies for that. Um, but they're learning things about gender. Um, they understand, you know, perhaps something based on the clothes that they're wearing. They may wear more pinks and purples as a girl or more dresses, things like that. Um, there's some gender role conditioning where caregivers may treat boys and girls differently and or encourage them or not encourage them to do certain things based on their perceived gender role. They're exploring their own body. They're learning about all the components of their body. You might ask a little kid, where's your nose? And they point to their nose. You know, they're kind of learning things like that. Oftentimes kids in this age run around naked. They love to be naked and don't like to wear diapers. Uh, things like that. They're learning about toilet training and you may be talking a lot about using the toilet or, um, you know, did they poop or did they pee? You may be using lots of language around toilet training. And then just the general curiosity that kids have about understanding the differences between their bodies, recognizing that they might look different than somebody else and having curiosity about their family members or their caregivers' bodies. So how does this correlate with Erickson's stages of psychosocial development? So Erickson in his, all of his stages have kind of an inherent conflict that a person goes through during the stage and you know, important events and virtues that are happening in each stage of development. So the psychological conflict between birth and 18 months is trust versus mistrust. And that's that attachment component with your caregivers. Can I trust you? Do I, can I not trust you? So as caregivers care for a child during this phase, the child is gleaning information and learning about trust and um, either learning to trust their caregivers or learning not to trust their caregivers. Um, think about if a, a child is growing up with a parent or a caregiver that has an addiction and that parent might inconsistently care for the child as a result of that addiction. And so the child might be learning more about mistrust and an inability to be able to trust their caregiver. Um, and the basic virtue that, that kids are learning here and 
and we kind of hope to instill in kids is hope is just that um, that they can they can trust people particularly their caregivers and the people that are important in their lives they learn a lot through the feeding process that's a primary way that we care for children by feeding them as an infant we're giving them bottles or breastfeeding um, and then as they grow teaching them you know how to feed themselves but we continue in the feeding process and and giving uh, those basic needs of, or fulfilling those basic needs of food. And then Erickson stage two goes from 18 months to that three year mark. The psych psychosocial conflict here is autonomy versus shame and doubt. So the child is learning some independence here. They're starting to do some things on their own. They're walking, they're talking, they have opinions and they voice those opinions. Uh, there may be some defiance in terms of wanting to do things on their own. Like, no, don't help me. I wanna do this on my own. Um, so the major question becomes, can I do things myself or am I reliant on the help of others? So some kids during this stage may heavily rely on their caregivers to help them. And that, that might be indicative of some um, attachment concerns. But same thing kind of on the other extreme, if they're completely independent and autonomous of their caregivers, uh, there may be some attachment concerns there as well. So the basic virtue here is their will, the, the, um, the child's will at this point. And the important events that you're kind of, as caregivers might be imparting on children at this age is through toilet training and teaching them and training them to use uh, the toilet and all the functions of that. So thinking about how a child is impacted during these stages of their sexual development and their psychosocial development, um, things like sexual abuse can, can significantly delay development and or cause problems in development, um, both sexually and psychosocially, but also can lead to in adulthood, some sexual dysfunction, some challenges with intimacy um, related to partnerships and, um, and particularly for our clients that struggle with addiction, um, intimacy and, and sex can be impacted by sexual abuse, for example, that occurs or in any, any trauma really, Sexual abuse in particular um, can really change and alter the trajectory of someone's sexual development and psychosocial development as it relates to um, having future intimacy challenges with partners as adults. Um, so that's something to kind of, I think we all know that from a, a logical standpoint and we see it in our clients, you know, but I think we can we can all agree that those kinds of events that occur in childhood can have lasting impacts into adulthood. And so that's something to pay attention to um, as we're working with clients. So we're gonna move through the rest of these a little faster so we can uh, make sure I have enough time to get to all of our, all the rest of the content today. So four to eight years considered late childhood, elementary school age, um, sexual development is around there might be some sexual play going on, like playing doctor, I'll show you mine if you show me yours, that kind of stuff. There's continuing gender royal role learning, how to behave like a girl or a boy. Um, they might talk about bathroom vocabulary and giggle about um, certain words that are used. They may ask questions about pregnancy and birth and babies, how babies are made, things like that. Um, they're starting to understand what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior around sexuality. You know, whereas a little kid, they might have, uh, a little boy might have gone out to the backyard and gone to the bathroom, no problem. And it's cute when they're little and they're three. And then when they get to eight years old, it's not cute anymore. And it might be problematic. Um, so, you know, learning things about what's acceptable or unacceptable behavior. There's the possibility of <clears throat> masturbation or self-stimulation at this point, although it'll be much more common in later years, but there may be some curiosity and that might be starting. Um, they may start to become more modest about their own body and be and want to cover up, um, whereas previously they liked nudity in the previous stages. 
And then they're starting to be aware of media influences, social media, um, you know, what they might see on TV or movies, things like that. And psychosocially, um, the Erickson stage is three to five here. Um, so there's a bit of a disconnect between the sexual dis development and the Erickson stage, but really the psychosocial conflict is initiative. Am I gonna take initiative to do things or um, is there some guilt or some even shame going on there? So the major question for kids at this age, am I good or bad? Um, and you know, what's my purpose to some degree in terms of the virtue? And they're really exploring the world around them in a lot of ways. They're learning lots of information. They're playing and learning socially how to interact with other people. And they might be in school, um, you know, during these ages of three to five. So they're, you know, socially interacting and learning how to be a friend and things like that. So early adolescence, that nine to 11 years, puberty might be starting, um, body changes might be going on. Again, possibility of masturbation. There may be um, some closeness of the same or similar gender identifying friendships. Like for girls, they may have best friends that are girls. And then they say, ooh, boys are bad and yucky or vice versa, um, where they are you know, kind of gravitating towards people they, per, or peers that they perceive are similar to them or the same. And there's the possibility of body exploration with other peers, you know, so they may, there may be some sexual interactions starting to happen with others. The Erickson stage four goes from six to 11 years. Um, and the psychosocial conflict here is industry versus inferiority. So this has a lot to do with their social interactions with others, with their peers. Um, are they included? Are they inferior or on the fringes somehow? Do they perceive themselves to be like others or different than others? Uh, the major question here is how can I be good? Um, so behaviorally speaking, as well as that um, identity of you know, who do I fit in with? Who do I not fit in with? Things like that. The basic virtue is competence. So learning kind of how to interact and their role in the world. And the, the primary event that they're dealing with here is going to school and interacting with their peers and teachers and kind of learning the, the structures of school and, and life um, in school. Adolescence, this is just a continuation um, and continued expression sexually, there's oftentimes masturbation going on. Puberty is kind of in full effect here. There's usually some sexual interactions that are, they're starting to experiment with at least uh, with others. Strong need for independence, strong desire oftentimes to be away from caregivers and be with their peers socially. Um, there's a possibility of pregnancy um, and you know unprotected sex sexually transmitted illnesses may be coming into play and conversations around contraception and sex safety may be happening. Um, and then the Erickson stage five here that corresponds 12 to 18 years, identity versus confusion. So the major question is an identity question. Who am I? Uh, basic virtue of fidelity and their important things or events here is their social relationships and social interactions with their peers. And we see that independence and autonomy um, grow exponentially during this time where they are starting to spend a lot more time with their peers rather than family and caregivers. There may be also the introduction of the workplace. If teenagers are starting to work in the community, then they're, whatever influences they're getting there and things they're learning through the workplace can be impacting all of this development as well. So now we're gonna drop the Erickson stages because Erickson doesn't go beyond um, that 18 year old mark, but we're gonna continue on with sexuality. And this incorporates some psychosocial components anyways, as we move forward. So 19 to 30 years, roughly, there's 
sexual activity with partners happening, masturbation. Oops, I skipped forward on accident. Um, there might be making decisions about partnerships, marriage, family life, their career. Where do they want to live? You know, they may have, did they go to college? Did they not go to college? That might have impacts on choices that they make. Possibility of pregnancy, childbirth birth and parenting during these years. Um, again, the same concerns around contraception and sex safety decisions, multiple partners, um, sexually transmitted illnesses may come up. And then the possibility of ending a relationship. So relationships start and stop. Um, so that may happen multiple times throughout. And at any point in time during all of these stages, particularly after puberty in adolescence gets going, there can be sexual dysfunction and that can cause some significant challenges in relationships. And then adult sexuality, 31 to 45 years, roughly, um, the selection of partners, decisions around that, the maintaining of relationships, you know, so as relationships are um, gone through over years, um, how does this, how does sexuality impact that? There may be relationships that are sexual in nature, that are longstanding, and how does that kind of sexual desire, the intimacy, all of those components of the sexual response cycle, how do those ebb and flow throughout the relationship? And how does that impact the relationship? Um, also, there's long-term friendships, which may turn into romantic partners or, uh, or not, but you know, maintaining of relationships in general. Possibility of masturbation continues, parenting responsibilities might continue, and how do you kind of move forward with the next generation if you have children? How do you educate your children about sex and sexuality? Again, possibility of pregnancy, childbirth. Again, decision-making about contraception and sex safety decisions. There's the possibility of grandparenting. So your children having children and um, possibility of ending a relationship. And then adult sexuality 46 onward there's uh, menopause andropause that might be going on grandparenting continued sexual activity continued partner selection or maintenance of a long-term relationship uh, masturbation contraception sex safety decisions um, possibility of divorce or death of a partner or spouse and how that impacts um, sexuality as well as uh, future relationship choice decisions. And then the body might start to respond differently sexually. It may continue to respond, but might be more slow. Um, people tend to be on medications the older that we get in the life, life phases. So medications might have a larger impact at this stage on um, how your body responds sexually. And there might be some sexual dysfunction going on there. So thinking about how addiction and trauma impact psychosocial development, there can be all kinds of things that happen. And I think we know this, I'm just kind of list, listing a few things um, that you might consider. So our brain and our body development could potentially be stunted as a result of addiction or trauma that we've experienced, whether it's been experienced personally by us or experienced through our family. Uh, our family members and what we've learned in our family of origin growing up or our significant adults that are in our lives that might have had addiction and trauma that's going to have a direct impact on us as children and then as we grow into adults as well. So there can be some growth stunting both physically but primarily we see it emotionally where we see them struggling to manage emotions or struggling to engage uh, in meaningful ways and in intimate relationships. And so that can be indicative of an addiction or trauma experience they've had in the past. We can see clients, particularly clients that are struggling with um, addiction related issues where they've engaged in some kind of sex work, prostitution, they might have turned tricks. Um, they may have been involved in sex trafficking or human trafficking. 
in some way as a result of their addiction. And so those can all have impacts on someone's ability to engage in uh, intimacy in a relationship, can cause some sexual dysfunction as, uh, as well. People who've experienced intimate partner violence um, and trauma that way, whether they've been the perpetrator or the, the victim in that scenario, there may be some sexual dysfunction or challenges going on in relationships. Sexual assault at any point or sexual abuse as a child, like I mentioned earlier, can, um, can have serious impacts. And then sexual dysfunction is, is something that's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes where they may have had um, one sexual experience where, where they had some dysfunction and then they're nervous and anxious during the next sexual experience that they're gonna have that same issue and almost you know, kind of make that issue happen again because it's had, they're so nervous and anxious about it. Um, so it can kind of be this endless cycle. And um, once someone's had sexual dysfunction, they're kind of at higher risk to continue having it going forward. Um, and decreased libido, you know, the, when we had trauma or addiction related issues that that can seriously impact our desire, our hormone levels, our brain activity. And so we might have decreased libido as a result. And then sexually transmitted illnesses can um, cause challenges depending on what they are and if they have lasting impacts or not. Um, if you need to disclose to a partner that you have a sexually transmitted illness and if that partner you know, rejects you because of it, then, then that can create challenges from an intimacy perspective. Um, and that kind of internal conflict of, do I tell my partner a potential sexual partner? Do I not? Um, what's the rationale for either of these things? Is there guilt and shame attached to having the sexually transmitted illness? Um, things like that can all kind of cause these challenges, both from a sexual dysfunction perspective, but also, uh, how it can impact us psychosocially and how we develop over the course of our lifespan and our ability to engage in intimate relationships. So kind of going back to our expression of human sexuality and, and just to give some context for continuing to think about this, con this construct that human sexuality encompasses a whole lot of things. It's a broad range of behavior and processes, includes, includes physiological responses that our body has, our psychological um, component of what we think about ourselves, how we perceive ourselves, our identity. There's some social constructs, how we engage socially with others, if we're accepted or not accepted by others. Cultural impacts, you know, in certain cultures, some displays of sexuality are more prominent than others or are more frowned upon than others. There may be a co political component or spiritual or religious components um, that impact our expression of human sexuality and sexual behavior. So looking at this wheel, um, I kind of see this as different domains that all interconnectedly um, feed and inform our sexuality and our sexual expression. So we have the body, we have the physiology of our body, our genitalia, our chemicals in our body, those kinds of things. We have thoughts and feelings in general. How do we feel and think about sex and sexuality and what do we think is appropriate or inappropriate? Then we have gender. Uh, gender is you know, how we identify gender-wise individually as well as how we interact uh, with the world and express our gender. Then we have relationships. You know, what is, how is our sexuality expressed in our relationships that are both sexual and non-sexual relationships? What is, you know, accepted by our partners or friends? What is not accepted? Sexual preferences might be a part of this. Um, what kinds of people we're attracted to both from a friendship perspective, as well as from a sexual attraction perspective. And then what are our values and beliefs, which this can bring in more of the spiritual, religious aspect or cultural elements of um, 
you know, what we value as people or individuals and our beliefs around sexuality and how we should express sexuality. So all of these components or factors influence how we behave sexually, how we express our sexuality, and can impact all kinds of things, not just in the bedroom of how we interact um, from a sexual activity perspective with a partner, but also how we display our sexuality in the way that we dress, the way that we um, engage with others in our community or the types of things we're involved in, um, in our work or our social interactions. All of that can be um, expressions of sexuality and we can express our sexuality in different ways, uh, depending on those different situations and constructs. So it's sexuality is not simple. <laughs> it is a very complex thing and has lots of layers to it. And from a clinical perspective as counselors, we want to explore all of these areas when we're working with a client, particularly if they're having some challenges from an intimacy perspective or a sexual dysfunction perspective. We wanna normalize being able to talk about these things and that it's okay to talk about these things and explore them in the context of our, the work that we're doing with the client. And then it's normal to have issues from time to time um, sexually or with our kind of expression of human sexuality. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about attachment. I talked about this a little bit in when we were going through the stages of psychosocial development. But let's kind of remind ourselves uh, about attachment theory. It may have been a minute since you looked at some of this stuff. So how are attachments formed in general? Um, think back to your uh, education days when you might've taken a class and talked about attachment theory or talked about Bowlby in particular. He was kind of a forerunner in the attachment theory world. There's been many contemporaries since then. But basically the central idea about attachment and attachment theory is that the relationships and the bonds between people, particularly the long-term ones, um, include those between a parent and a child and between romantic partners, that there is attachments that we form. Um, and that has impacts on how we behave in those relationships, not just from a sexual perspective, but also kind of how we interact behaviorally um, with our partners and in those relationships. So what we're looking at is the relationships and the bonds between people. And when we talk about stages of attachment from childhood, there's this on this graphic here kind of goes through these stages <coughs> of an infant. So there's the pre-attachment, which is birth to six weeks. The baby in and of itself knows, shows really no particular attachment to a specific caregiver. Some might, but usually uh, the caregiver is the one, you know, providing for the basic needs of the baby, uh, changing diapers, feeding, um, you know, holding the baby when they're crying, things like that. I'm trying to soothe the child. So it's, you know, but the baby is not necessarily showing a preference for one caregiver or another. And then six to six weeks to up to seven months, the infant might begin to show some preference for their primary and secondary caregivers. There are certain adults that they want to be held by, for example. Um, it might be, it's a little indiscriminate a lot of times where they just want to be held and they're happy to be held by anybody that will hold them. Um, but they might begin to show some preference for their primary caregivers. So if there's two adult caregivers in the home, they might show preference for those people compared to other adults um, that you know, might not be in their primary day-to-day um, -day life that's caring for them. And then seven months, seven to kind of 10 months is where they might be showing a really strong attachment to one particular caregiver. Like they always want mom or they always want dad to hold them. And maybe they cry with other people holding them, things like that. Or they go to one specific person to get needs met um, and will kind of reject to some degree other caregivers or cry with other caregivers. 
And then 10 months on, they, they're starting to have growing bonds with other caregivers. So maybe other important adults like grandparents or aunts and uncles, um, you know, best friends of their uh, caregivers, things like that, that might be consistent in their life. They might, uh, they might be developing bonds with those other caregivers. So thinking about these stages of attachment and how it can be impacted in these 10 months or 10 plus months, the first year of a child's life, you know, if they have inconsistent caregivers or people that are, you know, maybe in their part in their life for a small part of that time and not um, consistently, then, you know, that can cause some challenges with the baby's ability or the child's ability to attach to caregivers and can have, um, can have some long-term impacts in their ability to attach to um, in relationships in general, not just with caregivers. So attachment in general is not inherently healthy or unhealthy. Um, however, there might be different styles of attachment. So just to review attachment in general and the kind of basic styles, there's there might be nuances to this, but these are the four basic ones. There could be an ambivalent attachment where children become very distressed when a parent leaves. Um, in general, ambivalent attachment style is considered uncommon and an estimated seven to 15 US children have an ambivalent attachment. Um, so basically what's going on is that the children cannot depend on their primary caregiver to be there when they need them. And so they're scared of being abandoned by their caregiver. Um, so th that's why they become very distressed when a parent leaves is that they're worried maybe they're not coming back or um, that they're not gonna get their needs met while the parent or caregiver is gone. Um, and avoid an attachment um, where the child tends to avoid their parents or caregivers, or they show really no preference between a caregiver and a complete stranger. So this might be a result of abuse or neglect in their, in their childhood where a caregiver was, you know, neglecting them or very abusive to them. Um, children who are punished for relying on a caregiver will learn to just avoid seeking help from that caregiver in the future and they'll look to other people or they'll try to deal with it themselves. So there's an avoidant attachment there. Uh, there could be a disorganized attachment where there's a display of conf a confusing bit mix of behavior um, where the child might seem disoriented, dazed, or a little confused. They may avoid or resist the parent. Um, this lack of a clear attachment pattern is oftentimes linked to inconsistent caregiver behavior. Um, so parents may serve as both a source of comfort and fear, which leads to kind of confusing behavior of the child where sometimes they might be very attached to the caregiver or be afraid of them leaving. And on the other end, <coughs> um, may also avoid or be fearful of the caregiver. And then secure attachment is kind of um, the ideal is children who can depend on their caregivers, they might show some distress when separated from the caregiver, but then be joyful when they're reunited with the caregiver. <coughs> While they might be upset, they might gen when the caregiver leaves, they generally have a sense of understanding that the caregiver will return. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and when frightened, Securely attached children tend to be more comfortable seeking reassurance from other caregivers. So for example, when a child first starts to go to school like preschool or kindergarten, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, you know, initially when caregivers drop the child off, the child cries or throws a fit. And then after a little while realizes that, oh, my parent's going to come back and they're you know, start to have fun, their teacher might comfort them. Um, and they recognize when the parent comes back at the end of the school day to pick them up, they're excited and joyful and things like that. So that would indicate 
a more secure attachment. And at different times, kids can show these different attachment styles as, where, as well. <coughs> but these, these various attachment styles, <coughs> excuse me, I think I've been talking too long, so it's starting to catch up with me with the cough. So these attachment styles are often formed incredibly early. Like in the last slide, we're talking about the first year of birth. So what happens in terms of their attachment to caregivers can have long lasting effects into their adult relationships where they may really struggle <coughs> if they had an avoided attachment, for example, where they might've had abusive or neglectful caregivers as children, they may not as adults be able to trust their partners in, in intimate relationships that might lead to an inability or a struggle to, um, to kind of have a healthy relationship with an adult partner or in an adult relationship. Um, and any of these attachment styles, except for the secure one, can have lasting effects. Um, the other thing that can happen <coughs> from a development perspective is that as the child grows, based on these at attachments that they've, they've um, had from such an early age, can really cause them some challenges in their psychosocial development. So as they're learning to interact with their peers in elementary school, for example, <coughs> as they're learning to, um, you know, how to have relationships with peers, with teachers, with other um, people that might be in their lives, they may really struggle in those relationships to form secure attachments. Um, it can also stunt their emotional development, their ability to manage emotions, to soothe themselves when they get upset. They might have more anger, for example, and show more aggression, maybe a bully. They might be like the class clown. You know, there's all sorts of kind of behavioral components that could come up as a result um, or as partially a result of these attachments that they formed from such a very early age. And if those attachments were one of the first three, then it can have some lasting consequences there. Okay, so really what this means, what the bottom line is from treatment, a treatment perspective, no matter if it's an attachment issue, addiction issue, trauma issue, um, sexuality concerns, <coughs> that we really wanna approach clients from a trauma-informed treatment perspective. And that might require a little bit of a paradigm shift away from our traditional approaches to addiction treatment. So let's break it down a little bit. Trauma-informed care is where we are incorporating safety, choice, collaboration, trustworthiness, and empowerment in what we're doing with clients and the interventions that we choose when we're working with a client. So safety, ensuring physical and emotional safety. What's going on in your common areas or your waiting rooms? When clients walk in, are, is their privacy respected? Is it welcoming, you know, based on the kind of art that you have on the wall or the notices that you have on the wall to the furniture, to the paint color, all those things could have an impact on if it's uh, welcoming um, and if it's private. Choice, does the individual or the client have choice and control? Um, are they provided with um, their rights and responsibilities as a client? Are you going through that? with them? Um, do they have a voice in the treatment that they're being provided? Uh, collaboration, that you're making decisions with them and sharing the power of their, um, of their decision making in the kind of treatment that they receive. So um, are they a part of the treatment planning process? Are they a part of giving feedback of an evaluative nature to the program that they're in or to the services that they're receiving? Trustworthiness, are you demonstrating that, um, that, they can, that client can trust you or your agency. So um, that means that you might have boundaries, there's uh, consistency in the messaging that's given to clients, 
um, that it's respectful, professional, um, that you're, you know, fostering that trustworthiness that the client can trust you or trust your agency. And then is the client feeling empowered? Um, prioritizing empowerment and skill building. Are you providing an atmosphere that allows individuals to feel validated and affirmed with every contact? So that's from your front desk to your people answering the phone, to people doing billing, to people, um, to counselors, to nurses, medical staff, all of the different people that might be working with a client. Um, are all of these things being, uh, being taken into account? So what can we as counselors do? We can utilize trauma-informed care. We can engage in sexual affirming care. And really, I think one of the biggest things that we can do as clinicians is we can really challenge our own ideas of what is a healthy versus unhealthy sexual experience. So we might think about what are our biases or what are our own beliefs around sexuality? Um, do we think sex work is bad, for example? Do we think men or women should be doing uh, behaving in a certain way sexually. Um, you know, what are those kind of preconceived notions that we might have? And then challenging those, that those <clears throat> may not be choices that we would make or choices that, um, that would be healthy for us in our lives, but that it might be a choice that a client makes that's okay. And maybe it's not, um, problematic in their life. So um, examining our own belief system, I think, is one of the biggest things that we can do um, to create that atmosphere of welcoming for our clients, that we can, we can have these conversations with them and not be judgmental. Because I think most of the time, our clients are just really looking for a safe space to talk about these things. And sex, sexual dysfunction, can be a very vulnerable thing in, to talk about for a client. And it can be kind of awkward for us too. So getting comfortable with that, practicing um, using words that you're uncomfortable saying, for example. Um, you, like looking at our language and how we talk about sex, how we talk about human sexuality, um, avoiding kind of jargon or stereotypes, being culturally sensitive, um, getting training in things like the LGBTQ plus population, um, so that we make sure we're using the appropriate language and terminology <clears throat> to promote inclusivity and in treatment groups and programs. So we might have to do some psychoeducation with the other clients in our treatment program if we're doing groups um, about being judgmental when somebody talks about um, a particular sexual experience or their sexuality that might be different to manage bullying and things like that. Um, and we might also include sex or body positivity. So any, again, creating an atmosphere where it's okay and welcome to talk about sexuality, how we express sexuality, that it's okay for these things to be discussed in our treatment groups or in our counseling sessions. And to in general, normalize talking about sexual wellness in the context of relationships. Make it a normal thing that you um, kind of ongoingly assess in your clients. How are they doing from a wellness perspective related to sexuality? Are they feeling sexually satisfied in their relationships? Is, are they having any concerns? If you don't ask, a lot of times clients won't bring it up on their own. Um, we can also explore all these concepts we talked about today. So including that sexual wellness integration into our services, we can explore attachment or assess for attachment um, in childhood and also how that's impacting relationships now. Um, talking about boundaries, expectations around sex or relationships, how they're communicating in their relationships. Uh, we can include couples and family counseling. Um, for clients who've specifically been through trauma, using things like a seeking safety workbook or similar type programs that are evidence-based like seeking safety can be very helpful in helping clients explore um, what might be prohibiting them in uh, engaging in healthy, meaningful relationships and intimate relationships, but also can give them some skills and tools. <clears throat> Any kind of mindfulness activity is is going to be helpful in managing sexual dysfunction because a lot of it is related to anxiety where a, 
and, and psychological processes, unless there's a physiological component, which you can always refer somebody to their physician um, to talk about any kind of functional physical issues that might be going on. There might be some medication interventions um, that can be done for clients, but a lot of mindfulness activities can just kind of help clients to reduce the anxiety when they're about to engage in a sexual experience or in an intimate experience with a partner um, where they can do visualization, breathing, um, kind of grounding techniques to reduce that heightened emotion or anxiety response. So really any kind of mindfulness activities um, are helpful things to teach clients. We know that they're helpful anyways to help clients manage things like cravings or impulses to use in the addiction world, uh, but it can also be really helpful for sexual concerns as well. And then we can always do some psychoed with clients about their sexual health, um, talk to them about you know, contraceptive options if they're interested in that, or um, safe sex options, and you know, just fostering intimacy and communication in their relationships. We can help do all kinds of things um, to, to teach them communication skills or you know, the way to advocate for themselves in relationships, things like that. Okay, that's the end. So I know that was like a crash course in, in a broad overview of all things related to sexual dysfunction, addiction, we threw in trauma there and attachment um, and relationships and what we can do therapeutically. So I hope this has given you some new insight or reminded you of some things that maybe you had forgotten. Um, and just as a reminder, once this is finished, you will receive an email with a link to a, a little short quiz and, um, and a satisfaction survey. And then um, once you complete that quiz and survey, you will be sent your um, certificate so you can get your CEUs for today. And you should receive that pretty soon, but within 24 hours. So thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you again on a future webinar um, and have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone.